Hello everyone, my name is Kurazar, and welcome back to the Vintage Story Guide. We are back in the world on this fine autumn day, this brisk autumn day, in our drafty little house. And we just finished, in the last episode, making a whole bunch of new copper tools. We have a hammer, a pro pick, prospecting pick, we have an axe head, a shovel, and another pickaxe head in addition to two ingots and an anvil. And today, we are going to talk about what to do with some of these. In particular, this new one here, the prospecting pick. But first, before we get to any of that, I wanted to go check on the bees that we set up in a previous episode and see if we've gotten any honey production going. And from here, I can already see we have several skets full of honey and ready to harvest. So let's go ahead and harvest those and we will Put some of the honey to use for candles, and some of it we will store away for sealing crocs that we will need for surviving the winter. When you break these, sometimes the swarm of bees comes out, and they are pretty angry at you. We got lucky there, and as you can see, we got back 10 of the 16 cattail reeds that we originally put into the skep, in addition to the three honey. So we will be able to supplement that with some of the other cattails we have in our inventory and replace the skeps shortly. And no bees. Well, that's lucky in some sense, but I wanted to show you what the swarm of bees looked like, but we will certainly encounter them at some point in the future. I'm gonna go ahead and replace these skeps and then we will meet back in the house and talk about the prospecting pick. And actually, now that we're inside and I see this loam storage vessel again, that reminds me of something that I did between episodes. Don't worry, we'll get to you in a minute. So between the last episode and this one, I went back to the ruins off in the southwest and to the underground ruins over to the west here, and I found a few more goodies in the ruins, and I also tore down the underground ruins for the granite stone bricks and the aged wooden planks. And I wanted to show you what we got from those, because we got some pretty cool stuff, including items that we got by panning. So we got several books. We have two here, and I think we have some more over here. Yes, six books in total, two scrolls, which I think we found in another vessel in the southwest village ruin. We found several more copper arrowheads, some tin bronze lamellae and some tin bronze scales, some more native silver nuggets, a rough peridot, a copper spearhead, some rusty gears, five nuggets of native gold, another candle, a bunch of flint arrowheads, some more flax fibers, an emerald, and a whole bunch of bones. I'm going to go ahead and read these books to add them to our journal, and I will pop them up on screen so that you can pause and read them if you would like. We already had Dimitri's notes before, but now we have the second and the third pages. We just got Reflection, and looks like we got three pages of that. Here's page two and page three. We have letters, and I think we had, did we have one of these before? I know we had two journal entries previously. Here's the second one of that. We have return. We have confession. We just got diet of kings with two pages, and here's the second page. And we just got brief discussions with the traveler. Looks like a play. Here's page one. Here's page two. And here's page three. And while I was looking in here, I realized I missed something. I found something that I have never actually found in survival before. Here we go. It's an owl chest. It has a little owl face with glowing eyes on it. I thought we could store our rusty gears in there, keep them close to our bed, so any thieving drifters coming in can't find it. So, the moment I've been teasing this whole time, these tools. Let's pick up all of these tool heads and these ingots and this anvil, which we somehow 
got out of this very contoured mold without breaking it. Don't ask me how it works. It's physics. And I'm going to put the anvil down over here for now. We're not going to use this today. And I know I can hear some of you yelling, make a saw, make a saw. But we are not making a saw today. In fact, we're not going to do any smithing today. So you can put those ambitions aside for now. And there we go. I'd like to have a spare hammer because I go through these like butter. But I am going to keep these primitive axes for splitting wood into firewood because that can be sort of a waste of any forged or cast tool. So this prospecting pick, what does it do? As I said in the last episode, ores are not distributed evenly like they are in other block games. Instead, they are distributed according to a randomized heat map, and you have to go out and find them, and they can be very far away sometimes. And this is how we find them. To use the prospecting pick, it has two modes, and I think by default, unless you set it up manually during world creation, the second mode is not available. As you can see, I only have one mode here called density search mode. So we are going to need to actually enable the second mode and we will do that by opening our chat and typing in slash world config space pro pick node search radius and then a number. I'm going to go with eight. I understand it is ill advised to go above eight typically. And now that we've done that, we'll have to restart our game before it begins to work properly. So I'm going to go ahead and do that right now. And like that, we're right back. And I was reminded while I was reloading the game that we are actually about 30 hours in at this point. So we've been together for quite a while on this journey. So now we have two modes, which you can switch between using the F key, I think is the default. For me, it is something completely different. Don't worry about it. We now have density search mode and node search mode. You start with the density search mode. This gets you information on what ores may be in the area and we're going to break this limestone rock with it. You'll get this message that says, okay, need two more samples. You now have to go at least four, but no more than 16 blocks away and break a second block. So I'm gonna go four. So go one, two, three, four. I'm gonna go up one as well and break this rock here. And now we need one more sample. I'm just gonna go over here and grab this sample here. And like that, we get a list of ores that were triangulated. We have sphalerite, bismuthonite, emerald, malachite, galena, native copper, and lapis. And this interface tells us the chances of there actually being sphalerite or bismuthonite and so on in this specific chunk, as well as if it is there, what the approximate distribution is expected to be, or the, the density of that particular ore type. And this is a chance to also showcase one of the other mods we have on, which is called VS Prospector Info. Normally, this chat log is cleared every time you leave the game, which means that if you have prospected for ore and you want to remember where it is, you may have to open your map and create a little icon and write down what's in there. And I used to do that, but that ends up with your map getting absolutely cluttered with icons denoting which resources and which ores are found in what areas, and it just gets to be a mess. So VS Prospector Info creates an overlay. And whenever you hover your mouse over it, it will show you what those ores were that you prospected. Now, prospecting for ore one or two chunks over isn't likely to change the outcome a whole lot, unless you happen to have a small disk formed that only covers a few chunks. So if I dig here, I'm going to prospect here. There we go. So you'll see if we bring up both of these at once and flip between them, the difference in the measurements is very slight. So it usually doesn't behoove you to use the prospecting pick in adjacent chunks or even up to one chunk away. 
and you may just want to move farther away. It is important to note that this prospecting pick mode will not pick up surface deposits of copper or any other surface deposit, so things like lead or I think borax is also exempt along with anything else that you'll find that have little nuggets on the surface indicating where they are. While the density search mode will find salt in the area, it will not be able to pick it up in node search mode. So how do we use this to pinpoint exactly where we think we should dig down in order to find the ore we're after? By looking at these two chunks that we mined here, the sphalerite goes from 0.7 to 0.8 absolute. That seems really tiny, but that's actually not too terrible of an absolute value. That means that of all of the blocks that could possibly be in this vertical chunk here, which is thousands and thousands and thousands, 0.8% of them should be sphalerite or zinc ore. So if we wanted to go after that, we would first need to get away from all of these drifters, which I think I will do right now. Hey, drifties. Hey, buddy. That's right. No, thank you. What we might do is we might come up here to, let's say, this chunk, where I spy more grifters down there in the field, and we will prospect in this one and see what we can find here. And in areas where you have exposed rock on the sides of rock faces and so on are great places to actually prospect for ore. Reduces the digging you have to do. Oh, come on, buddy. So let's see if this is in the chunk that we're looking for. We're going to go up here and take care of this drifter. Oh. Okay, let's try this again. So, let's prospect this one here. Got sample one. This will not be far enough away. Got sample two. And we'll come over here and jump and get sample three. So here we have, ah, 1.3% sphalerite. And some of the other ores fell off the chart there but we do have some higher native copper. Now that native copper, as I said, since this doesn't detect surface ores, and as you can see, it didn't detect any presence of lead, which is here in the surface, that is copper that would be buried deep in the ground, probably somewhere deep in the granite layer. So since we have a pattern of going up by digging farther north, I think if we keep going north, we can find an area that has even more concentrated salarite. Let's do that. Let's try this chunk here. Okay, here we see that we've actually gone down. So the question is, do we need to go back to this chunk and go left, or do we go a different direction? I think I'm going to go right from that chunk and see what we get on the other side of our farm which, by the way, I have not replanted and am leaving fallow for two reasons. One, it is now October, and as you can see, the morning temperature is 6.3 degrees Celsius. A lot of plants are going to stop growing very soon, and they may even start dying at these temperatures. Moreover, we have some nutrient depletion in the soil, and leaving this fallow at the end of the season will help it recover in time for spring. We're going to go ahead and harvest these real quick before we continue our discussion on the prospecting pick. Okay, and here we are. Let's start digging. And here we go. So we're getting even warmer. We've upgraded from poor sphalerite chances to decent sphalerite chances and a 1.9% absolute. I'm going to try prospecting down in this little gully here and see if this gives us anything interesting. Still 1.9% absolute. 
and decent chances. So I think we're probably going to round out this sort of square area here and see if it gets any higher. So here we're getting colder, which means that I think I want to go one extra chunk this direction and test the water, so to speak, over here in this little corner, I think. Okay, still decent sphalerite, so I think we're in a pretty good area here. So let's go... We might even just go down in that gully and dig from there. So what we can do here is we can change over to the node search mode. And this mode only requires us to break one block. And what it does is it tells us for certain if there are any ores within the radius we defined, which in our case is eight blocks, and if so, how many within approximate reading. I'm going to go ahead and we'll just start digging straight down here. We have no ore nodes nearby. Okay, that's fine. So let's start building a ladder down. And we'll get a torch in hand. And we will start digging our way down. And every so often, about every, I like to go about every 12 to 16 blocks, we will stop and we'll dig another block of stone out with our prospecting pick and see if there's any ore nearby. Okay, here we are. We're going to prospect directly below us. And we have no war nodes nearby. Now we can also dig out four blocks in each direction with our regular pickaxe. And then mine out the fifth block with the pro pick to sort of expand our radius by five blocks, approximately. I'm just going to do this north and south rather than all the directions, because I think the sphalerite is going to be even farther below us. Yeah, nothing here. Let's go another 16 blocks down, and we'll try again. And we still have nothing. Well, we can make some more ladders, and we can keep going a little bit. We also hear a lot of drifters. Okay, let's try again down here. Nothing that way. And nothing that way. This time I think we will look left and right, east and west. Now there we go. So we found trace amounts of sphalerite in this direction somewhere. I'm going to go ahead and drop a torch here, just to keep this area safe. Let's go wandering in this direction. Now, since we had to come five blocks in this direction to even find any sphalerite, which, by the way, is going to be impossible to spot with our eyes in this granite, you'll see when we find it, that means we should probably keep going at least another five blocks. And there we go. It is upgraded from trace amounts to medium amounts because we're getting closer, which means that there are more blocks of the zinc ore in the radius of our propic. So from here, we should probably begin to branch out. I'm going to go five more in this direction to see if it gets any denser first. If it does, then we'll move five more blocks. Nope, it is medium amounts. So from here, we can go left and right, or in this case, north and south. So we have medium that direction. And we'll probably have somewhat less in this direction then. But if we don't, that means we may be directly above or below it. Medium mounts. Okay. That's a good sign. I'm going to go a few more blocks in this direction. Drop a torch here, too. And from here, we're going to go straight up and down. 
we don't get drifters falling on our heads. Oh, and there it is. I'm looking at the tooltip, not the rock itself. So zinc ore is incredibly hard to see. And here, let's get up there. And I'll show you just how hard it is to spot this stuff. That is zinc ore in granite. That is granite with no zinc ore. The only difference are these like six or seven pixels of very slightly darker material. And that's why I like to keep the tooltip display up on my hood at all times because that way you'll know you actually have zinc ore. So we finally found some zinc ore. It's medium, it's in granite, and we're going to dig the rest of this out and we'll take it home with us. Oh, and we just got the scary music, which means we're at about 64% stability. That's okay though, I don't get worried until we hit about 50%. That might be all the zinc ore. Let's find out. Verified trace amount. That means there's only a few blocks left. So we're going to just hammer at these sort of corner bits. Nope, oh, there's a little bit right there. Just scanning the ceiling with my hood. Trace amounts. You know, I'm pretty satisfied with that, and zinc honestly isn't my favorite metal to work with. It's only useful in a very few alloys. So let's gather our things, namely our ladders here, and let's head home and break these up and put them in our chests. Okay, we are home safe and sound. Let's take stock of what we got. So we got 22 medium chunks of sphalerite. Now this is zinc ore, and zinc by itself isn't used for much. What it is used for, however, is for making alloys. And there are a couple that I know of off the top of my head, and I don't think there are any others. First is to make brass. Now brass is used for a very few things because it's not particularly durable. It is used to make primarily brass torch holders and lanterns. And lanterns are great, but I have another preference for a different material for lanterns, and we'll get to that soon. Other thing it is used for is to make bismuthinite bronze. And so we actually have enough material here that we might be able to at least temporarily advance ourselves into the Bronze Age. We could make some bismuth bronze pickaxes or maybe just one, and that would enable us to mine some harder materials such as quartz or even iron. But we're going to hold off on that for now, and we're going to continue emptying our inventory. Because down here, I placed some of these aged crates, which we found when we explored the underground ruins off to the west there. And I placed them down here, and these are actually an alternate storage method. They are a, an interfaceless container that can store typically more items than a chest can. Now, I think that for these aged crates, that's not true. These are the smallest crates. However, they are still larger than our vessels because they have effectively 16 slots of inventory to work with. To interact with them, you can crouch and right click to add one by one. You can crouch and shift or crouch and sprint right click to add a whole stack. You can right click to remove one by one and you can shift right click to remove a whole stack. We're going to go ahead and put all of these granite stones in here listen to the drifters sing us the song of their people and I'll bring you all back in the morning when I want to touch on something else we can now do in the earliest stages of the Copper Age. Well the game seems to be endeavoring to make a liar of me because I have a temporal storm warning and this is the this is the first medium temporal storm I've mentioned but this is actually the second one of the world. I had one a while back while I was doing some between episode prep. But look at that gaggle of drifters, or I guess it could be a groan of drifters, or whatever. 
make up your own name in the comments. Anyway, I'm going to go and hang out in our little hidey hole over that away, and let the storm blow over. I'll record it just in case something interesting happens, and if I do, I will certainly leave a timestamp to jump to. But if not, I will just bring you all back when the storm is over and the harvesting is done. We can get back on to the topic at hand. Well, that was about as lame of a temporal storm as you can get. So I'm going to go clean up what I can clean up out here, and we'll get back on topic. Now, one of the other more basic mining techniques that we have access to in the early Copper Age and beyond is what's called relieving of stone. If you've noticed while we've been mining today and in our last episode, when I mine out a block of stone, all we get are little stone bits. This sort of stones we can throw or turn into cobblestone, or in some cases, nap. But how do we get the whole block? What if I want to use a whole block of stone for building or for other purposes? And there are other things you can do with stone, such as turning it into slabs or bricks for making other blocks, like those granite stone bricks that we found in that one ruin. Well, to do that, you have to relieve the stone, meaning specifically you have to remove all other blocks that are touching that piece of stone. So let's start with, say, this wall here. This will be pretty easy to relieve some stone from. So let's say that I want to relieve this block here. This has what looks like one, two, and three connecting blocks. So if I mine away all of these, all of a sudden we get a full stone block that we can then hold in our hand and we can place again. Now, again, we've placed it, it is still a rock block. So to get it again, we have to once more relieve it, which is why I put it on a piece of dirt. Aside from making fancier building materials, we can also use these stone blocks to make the first machine that we will ever have. What we're going to make is called a quern. Quern is a very low-tech mill, essentially. It's a bunch of stone slabs put together that you spin, you spin the stone slabs, and they have teeth sort of in between them, and you throw your grain or whatever in there you want to crush, and it grinds it for you like a mill. So let's get a few of these. And we will make ourselves a quern, and that will open up some new cooking opportunities for us. And of course that stone ended up way up there. There we go. With four stone blocks, specifically in this case granite, we can make the quern. Now granite is not the only stone you can use for a quern, but it is one of the few. The other stones you can make querns from are peridoite, andesite, and basalt, or basalt, depending on where you're from. To make the quern, pretty simple. You need the four stone blocks, put them in your crafting grid like so, and you get your quern. And the quern can be placed just like any other block. And it is affected by gravity, so if you break the block beneath it, it will actually drop. And if it hits anything, I think it just sort of will hover in the air. I'm not positive. It doesn't break things like an anvil might, though. And it has an interface. And let's, let's go grab some grain to grind in this quern. So you right-click it to get in the inventory. You then place your material that you want to grind in here, and then you just hold right click down, and it will slowly begin to grind it. Now, grains are not the only thing you can grind here. There are other uses for it as well. Uh, for instance, if you are making quicklime to make mortar, or if you are making lime water for beginning the process of curing and tanning hides to make leather, you can grind up limestone or borax, and you'll get a limestone borax powder. As you can see, though, this process is not quick, and it does mean you have to sit here and hold right-click for a while. Now, luckily, as we progress through the game, we will get ways of automating this process. But we are a ways away from that, so for now, we get to sit here and enjoy the sight of this thing spinning rather slowly. And we have one last one to go. Ugh, boy, my arms are tired. And we now have 32 spelt flour. 
Now, similar to the spelt green, spelt flower has a pretty long shelf life. Compared to the original grain, it lasts for an additional six years. So if you have grain that's getting kind of low on its spoil timer, you can actually grind it into flour and put it back in whatever container you had before, and it will effectively reset the timer. This may not be intended behavior, and it may not be around forever, but smoke them while you got them. So now we have flour. We can make a few new things with it. However, to do that, we need water first. Now, getting water in the early game without a bucket is a bit of a hassle. And currently, while we do have a jug, I think it's upstairs, jugs are not interactable as far as flour goes. And I've actually put in a request to see if that is a bug or intended behavior. So for now, we get to use bowls. And bowls are highly inefficient at this because they make one at a time. So I'll bring y'all back when this is all done too. Okay, not gonna lie, that was painful. Kids, don't do this at home. Just get a bucket, it's way easier. Now that we have our dough, you can see that its spoil timer is significantly shorter than the 1.7 years in our inventory from before. So once you make dough, it is use it or lose it. So let's go ahead and make our first bread. However, I can tell you before we even begin that making bread on a fireplace or on a fire pit isn't the best way to go about it. But let's try it out anyway and see, how, see what happens. As you can see here, the fire pit says we'll create one spelt bread charred. And that's because, have you ever tried to bake something next to a fire? I mean, actually bake something? Baking requires heat coming from all around, whereas a fireplace or a fire pit only has heat coming from one direction. So let that residual heat finish cooking that bread into the grossest, yuckiest, blackest bread you ever did see. Now on the upside, the charred bread will actually last a good while in your inventory or anywhere else. Uh, 17 days in your inventory. Uh, looks like it was 53 days being inside this sort of stone area here. And its nutrition isn't great. Most grain has a satiation of 60. And when we bake that into a meal, it roughly triples it, I think, if we make porridge. This is only a little bit more than that but the problem is that bread is kind of like eating cooked meat or vegetables raw in that it doesn't actually extend your satiation beyond the raw value it gives you here it doesn't pause your bar from dropping so what better methods exist for cooking bread that would be the clay oven i'm going to remove these things and put them on the ground and i'm going to make a few ovens and we will put them here and here flanking our fire pit now these clay ovens must be made with fire clay. You cannot make them with blue clay. And as I recall, they take either a stack or some more than a stack of fire clay each. So we'll go ahead and we'll make two of them. There we have our first clay oven, which mysteriously changes direction once it's made. It's physics. Now these, oddly enough, don't need to be fired. And I don't know if that reflects real life. I don't know if maybe in real life they sort of end up being fired via their first use, or if that's simply an oversight in development. I'm gonna go ahead and make the second one, and then we will start baking. Okay. Now we have two clay ovens flanking our fire pit. How to use the oven. These are very old timey oven designs in that they have a single chamber. And so in order to use them, we have to first burn wood in them. And I think it only takes wood. I don't think we can load it with peat. Nope. You must burn firewood in them. And it's good that we have this here. Each oven can be preheated with up to six firewood. Like so. 
and then we can go ahead and light them. And the oven also has its own temperature indicator in the HUD tooltip at the top of the screen. I'll grab one more. And unlike the fire pit, which cooks bread one at a time, the oven cooks them in groups of four. And there we go. We have a fully preheated oven, 280 degrees. I'm going to move this soup pot to there. So now we can put our bread in. And if you sit and watch, you can actually see it slowly start to rise as the dough begins to heat up. And what will happen is, oh, then, there we go, starting to pop a little. What will happen is they first go to a part-baked state and then after about the same amount of time in, as it took to get to the part-baked state, they will then become the full-baked state. Now, unfortunately, unlike soup pots, you do kind of have to babysit anything you put in the clay oven. Because if you leave it there too long, it will come out burned. Although if you want bread that lasts a little bit longer in storage, you can burn it intentionally, but I don't see much of a point in doing that. There we go, we have three loaves of baked spelt bread. Now, that charred bread gave us, I believe, 210 satiation. The fully cooked but not burned spelt bread gives us 300. Now, that isn't the only thing that we can bake in clay ovens. We can also take our dough, and as long as we have a surface, such as a table here, we can crouch and place an empty pie crust. And if we hover over it, you can see it's trying to tell us, well, it was a minute ago, the tooltip was telling us that we can fill it with stuff. In our case, we have some oh, completely spoiled berries. We're not going to use those, I guess. We don't have any meat. We do have plenty of veggies. So let's make ourselves a yummy, I don't know, turnip maybe? 78 days, 72, yeah, we'll do the turnips. We'll make ourselves a nice turnip pie. And you just right click, one, two, three, and four. And that's maxed out. And then you can take more dough. You can actually cook this, I think you can cook these without a top on them if you want, but you don't get as much grain satiation then. And there we have a raw turnip pie. Now, you can also take a knife and this is just for aesthetics, but you can take a knife and you can right-click with it to change the type of pie crust you want on it. Now, traditionally, a meat pie, and only a meat pie, would have a completely solid crust, and then you could potentially pick one of these two other types for maybe vegetables and for fruit, for instance, but it doesn't really matter. Once you have the pie, as long as your oven is still preheated, and I don't think it is hot enough anymore. So let's just give you three pieces of wood and we'll light you up again. And we are preheated, so let's put our pie in. And again, you can also watch your pies rise and they, they rise, I don't know, six or eight pixels. But the pie will also go from raw to partly baked to fully baked. And then if we leave it in there, it will become burned or charred. And similar to bread, burned or charred pie doesn't give as much nourishment, but it does last a little bit longer in storage. And there we have a yummy turnip pie. Now, I don't think we can eat this whole. No, we can't. You must place it on a surface while crouching, apparently and then you must cut it with a knife to get four slices. And here we have each slice will give us 240 grain satiation and 300 vegetable satiation. And similar to meals cooked in a soup pot, these are considered meals, not just food. So eating them will actually, once again, pause our hunger bar for, in this case, about two and a half minutes. Now, if I'm being perfectly honest, I'm not the biggest fan of pie. 
it does have certain advantages over cooked meals. Uh, one in particular is that it is easier to stack and bring a lot more of a fully prepared meal with you. I think they stack maybe to 64. I'm not sure exactly. But they stack a lot better than actually, than soup pots because they don't stack at all. And same with bowls full of meals. Um, however, if you f end up running out of those in the field, you, unless you happen to be carrying a corn around in your back and a bucket in your inventory and you're on a long journey, you're not going to be able to replenish your food unless you then stop and make a clay soup pot and bowl. So I typically prefer to carry a bowl and a pot with me if I go on adventures. And because you can't preserve pies, I like to use crocs instead and fill them with full meals. However, the pies themselves do last a little bit longer in storage or in your inventory. Down here, if we go take a look at the pies that are in this vessel, they last 28 days. Uh, this unsealed fired crock full of food lasts about 14 and a half days when it was fresh. And in our inventory, that translates to eight days versus 3.8 days currently. So eight days versus about four and a half, maybe five days. So if you need shorter food preservation, then the pies may be the way to go. Otherwise, I much prefer soup pot meals. Well, everyone, I think that's going to do it for this episode of the Vintage Story Guide. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in the prospecting pick and quarrying stone and our first foray into baking with grain that we ground in our very own quern. As always, my name has been Kurazar. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.